Um, it's, it's wonderful to have Amelia with us and uh, to have her in conversation with uh, Winita Cox, who is our Windrush Research Fellow here at the Institute of, of Commonwealth Studies. And we've been doing some really fantastic uh, preliminary research for a longer term project we have to, to record the, the testimonies, the memories of the Windrush generation and their descendants and, and look at the, the situation of uh, black British people in, in the UK. Um, Amelia Gentleman uh, uh, is, um, is someone I admire immensely for her work in this area. Um, uh, the uh, scroll back now nearly, well, over two years to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, in April 2018. This was supposed to be a kind of showcase event for Theresa May and um, brexit -y Britain. Um, <laughs> and instead, it turned into a, a, a very public shaming of the British government over the Windrush affair. And I mean, put it like this, there were a lot of people involved in that process, a lot of people putting their cases forward, trying to get heard. But if it hadn't been for Amelia Gentleman's really pioneering journalism, there wouldn't have been such a, an eruption of publicity around this. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a fantastic example of the very best of, of investigative reporting. And um, Amelia published a book about uh, her work on, on the back of that, which is a, is a fantastic read. So it, it's, it's great to have Amelia with us. Um, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Anita. Uh, to start the conversation. Thank you, Philip. Hi, Amelia. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I hope you've, uh, I don't know what you've been doing with, during um, the lockdown, but um, I'm just wondering how you would have conducted your research if that had been the case um, when this all happened beforehand in uh, 2018. Um, well, I've been mainly here in my bedroom where I'm talking to you from now and obviously as a reporter it's immensely frustrating. The kind of work that I do which is normally very face-to-face -face and involves um, long conversations with people. It's been really frustrating to have to try and do most of that over the phone. I've, I've ventured out a bit. I've been um, looking at the um, really amazing um, attempt by the government to rehouse everybody sleeping rough in um, hotels. So I've been to visit um, a holiday inn that's been um, turned over to um, house rough sleepers. Um, and I've also been in central London looking at the um, uh, proliferation of a, a kind of whole new community of rough sleepers but most of the time um, I've been really confined at home so it has been yeah it has been frustrated frustrating but I'm really really glad to have been asked to talk to you and I'm glad that we've managed to do this um, online because um, we were hoping to do it uh, in person just as the lockdown began so thank you for asking me well, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to what you're talking about um, housing rough sleepers um, mm. later on, because I'm, I'm curious to find out if, if, if maybe part of the Windrush cohort are number in those um, mm. rough sleepers. But just going back to the beginning um, of your research, I know that um, Guy Hewitt, you know, one of the the uh, Caribbean diplomat, I believe he's the Bayesian um, High Commissioner to London. Yeah. And he had spoken about having a sense that something was going wrong around about 2015 mm. and then having spoken to the Foreign Office in maybe 2016. Um, 
trying to uh, talk to um, Caribbean governments um, to see if, you know, if, if they were aware of something strange going on. But mm. just nothing seems to have happened. How did, how did you actually come to recognizing there was a problem? Um, so I came to it completely by chance um, when I was tipped off or when I was con contacted by a charity um, in Wolverhampton called the Refugee and Migrant Centre in Wolverhampton, um, who deal with um, all range of, of um, immigration issues for people in the um, Midlands. And they were really worried about one of the people that they've been helping, who was a, a woman called Paulette Wilson, who'd arrived in Britain at the age of 10 in, um, I think, 1965 from Jamaica, um, lived here all her life, hadn't ever returned to Jamaica. She didn't even have a passport. And as she approached uh, retirement, she'd been uh, arrested twice and um, served with Home Office um, letters telling her that she was in the UK illegally and that she was liable for deportation. So the charity emailed me and um, said that they were really worried that she was going to be deported and could we highlight her case in The Guardian. Um, luckily, before, um, before we were able to do that, she was released from Yarlswood, which is an immigration uh, removal centre. And um, w with the help of her MP, she was able to go home. But she was still getting letters from the Home Office saying that uh, she was liable for deportation. And I went to um, interview her uh, at her home with her daughter and with um, somebody from this amazing charity. And it was just very perplexing because there didn't seem to be any logical reason why the Home Office would be targeting somebody who hadn't um, committed any offence, who'd been a taxpayer for 40 years, whose daughter and granddaughter were British uh, citizens, somebody who'd worked for a while in the House of Commons, serving food to um, MPs. It just was really weird. Um, but as soon as the piece was published in The Guardian, I began to get emails from other people who had relatives in um, similarly difficult uh, situations. And as you said, I mean, it was an issue that lots of people had been trying to highlight for um, a long time from kind of different, um, from different organizations. So um, a lot of immigration lawyers were aware of this. Um, some MPs were coming across stories like this. The high commissioners um, from Jamaica to um, Barbados to Trinidad were um, concerned about it and had tried to raise it, but somehow, um, it never really gained um, real political attention and it certainly didn't gain any public attention, partly because it was quite a kind of complicated immigration issue at a time when we were seeing lots of different uh, really compl complicated immigration issues. And, and I think it was, it was hard for people to understand why this was so uniquely um, shocking and, and wrong. I think it just got kind of um, drowned in, in a kind of a, a, a background of, of a really, really complex and toxic um, debate around immigration. Did you, so I noticed that in your book, you sort of, the first half of your book is a series of interviews um, that you conducted with a lot of the survivors of the Windrush betrayal. Um, I was interested, what were the patterns that emerged? I mean, did you sort of spot um, particular patterns or were they all really different sorts of cases? Uh, no, there are really clear patterns, um, but it was um, not at all clear to me at the beginning, you, you know, what they were. So I look back at the um, interviews that I did and the research that I did now, two, two and a half years on, and I feel kind of quite frustrated with myself for not, for not having been able to see immediately what the issue was. And I mean, partly that's because I'm not, um, I'm not an immigration expert. I've written quite a bit about the Home Office, but um, I had to teach myself a whole um, 
I had to educate myself in 20th century um, nationality law and immigration law um, before I really understood what was going on. And also I had to do a really um, deep dive into the development of um, a whole series of hostile environment um, policies that began to be introduced by the coalition government from 2010 onwards. But the... Um, I think um, I think in a way it was really fortuitous that the first person who I spoke to about this um, was somebody who'd been affected really, really profoundly and dramatically. So Paulette was facing deportation back to a country that she had, you know, had no contact with for over half a century. Um, and to begin with, I began to try and find other people who were similarly being threatened with um, deportation. And, and the second person I, I met um, was a man called Anthony Bryan, who had also been in immigration detention for five weeks, had also arrived here at the age of um, nine from Jamaica in the 60s, worked, had no kind of immigration issues until he reached uh, retirement age. And he ha had um, had this long time in immigration detention and was also facing um, deportation. And there is an amazing drama about him, which if um, you have time, you should definitely watch on Monday night on BBC Two, I think. Um, and it, it, it describes his um, experiences really, really powerfully. But um, it took me a long time to realise, actually, as well as these really, really extreme cases, there was a lot of other stuff happening in a slightly you know, one notch, um, less dramatic way. So I began to get contacts from people who had been sacked, people who'd been um, told that they weren't allowed to work, people who'd been told that they weren't allowed to claim benefits, or who weren't um, eligible for free NHS healthcare, and people who'd been denied passports, so weren't able to travel to visit um, relatives, um, often in the Caribbean, often their parents who were very ill. So it was kind of gradually um, becoming clear that this was a um, bit of um, a, a kind of home office mistake that was part of a bit of, of um, targeted legislation around creating um, this hostile environment and it was affecting people in a whole spectrum of, of different and you know life shattering ways but not everybody was being detained and not everybody was being um, threatened with deportation and, and the other pattern I suppose that began to become obvious was that quite often um, people's problems began because they had themselves tried to do something often quite constructive, like they tried to apply for a pension or they tried to apply for a British passport so that they could travel or they had um, tried to apply for a new job. And any of these um, ac actions somehow invisibly triggered um, home office attention to their situation and it became obvious um, first often to the Home Office that they didn't have um, documentation proving that they were in the UK legally. And then they would be asked to um, rectify that situation. And for um, most of those affected, that was an almost impossible task um, for two reasons, really. For, firstly, that the um, well, for three reasons. Firstly, that it's um, a very expensive process to naturalise. Um, secondly, that it requires a lot of um, documentary evidence and the Home Office set the bar very, very high for people who were in this cohort of, of um, people that we now call the Windrush generation, but who are really um, is anybody who arrived in the UK before 1973 when legislation got um, tightened. Um, so the Home Office would ask them to provide documentary evidence placing them in this country every year since 1973. And it was very, very difficult for people to do, particularly if they'd been um, made homeless or if they lost their jobs as a result of this, because it's also kind of a, a time consuming and expensive process to gather together all of that stuff. And then thirdly, um, it was hard for people to 
to try and extract themselves um, from this because often they needed um, legal advice or the advice of, of um, a, a kind of well-informed charity and legal aid for immigration cases had been kind of stripped away from 2010 onwards and a lot of the kind of community organizations that would previously have been able to um, offer advice have, were, were in the throes of, of huge financial problems or, or have shut entirely because of the whole kind of trail of um, austerity related uh, cuts. So yeah, people found themselves in an incredibly complicated um, position, which although they um, realized was um, a, a mistake, although they realized that they were um, being wrongly classified as illegal immigrants, it wasn't at all simple to um, just point that out to a Home Office official. It, it was a really, really um, horrifically complicated situation to, to have to try to extract themselves from. Um, can you tell us something as well about, because I, I know you went, I think you went overseas to Jamaica, and I was sort yeah. of interested as to how that side of things ended up happening, you know, because you know, I can see how you would have got information from people in the grassroots here, but not so much. Mm. How did you make the link with people having sort of traveled to Jamaica or other parts of the Caribbean and then not being allowed back into the country? Um, well, so I went to Jamaica the, the summer a few months after um, this had, had all erupted in the UK and after we'd had that um, um, Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit where finally um, the Caribbean diplomats had, had come to Theresa May and um, shamed her really into apologising and and um, triggered the, the kind of sequence of events that saw Amber Rudd resign and saw the beginnings of, of a series of commitments that, you know, um, the government would do right by the Windrush generation. Um, and as that as as the um as the issue began to really take hold as a national and for a while an international story we we began to get a, an extraordinary number of um emails and phone calls at the guardian so i'd been kind of getting them um sporadically since um we published that first story about paulette wilson but around the time, around that time in April, we had this issue on the front page of The Guardian for um, uh, pretty much for two weeks or, or more every day. That was, um, it, it was um, incredibly high profile for us as, a, as an issue that we were pushing. And as a result, we, we got so many people um, getting in touch by email. We had to create a special um, database where we logged every single um, case of person who came forward and um, somebody was um, employed kind of full time in replying to everybody who got in touch explaining that you know whilst we couldn't write about every case this is how they should um, try and get assistance and, and signaling them to different organizations who might be able to help and in and amongst them there were a lot of people who wrote to us saying um, I think that this might be why my father or my friend's father has been stuck abroad for years. Um, and could you look into that? So um, initially a colleague of mine went to Jamaica, I think in um, maybe in May, 2018. And he met um, just a, 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 a kind of handful of really um, disturbing, um, of, of, he met a lot of very interesting people who had disturbing accounts of, having gone to Jamaica, for example, for a 50th birthday party and getting stuck and not being able to explain to the local um, uh, representatives of the British High Commission that they were in fact British and should be allowed to, to return. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went again in, in the summer of that year and just with a whole, um, portfolio a kind of folder of, of different um, pieces of people who I wanted to try and meet um, and it was really really uh, a, a shocking for me experience I hadn't been to Jamaica before and um, 
I didn't really see any of the um you, you know tourist sites whilst I was there we just were on on the road going to um different places where people were stuck um and I met um the a really um amazing man called Vernon Van Riel who was a, a, a famous um, boxer in Britain in the um, late 1980s who had um, decided to, to spend some time in Jamaica and had never been able to come back and hadn't um, I mean who was living in really really destitute conditions um, and I suppose what was particularly stark for me about interviewing him was that um, as as a kind of as a procedure whenever we publish a story about an individual we have to go to the home office for comment to say we're writing about this person he says x y and z can you comment and and it's a kind of formality but it's also just to make sure that you, you know they don't that there isn't um any bit of information that we don't know or that we need to be aware of um and as soon as um, we, I was in touch with the Home Office to say that we were writing about Vernon Van Riel, um, his case was already being thought about by officials. But within, I think, 48 hours, a um, car had, had been um, hired from, um, from Kingston and he was couriered a first class ticket back um, on, with British Airways back to, back to London after I, I can't remember how many years but years of, of him trying to get back and I mean he was horrified because the ticket had the price of you know 1,700 pounds it, it was just crazy but it was very um that was very much the pattern of um this whole series of reporting that every time we went to the home office to say we're writing about this person do you have any comments we'd get a very um generic comment from from officials but within hours um sometimes before the piece was even published uh, uh, officials would would have dispatched documents or called the individual and tried to sort things out which was which was great but also a kind of very peculiar way to respond to something that was clearly a systemic problem mm. so one, you know, while you were in Jamaica, I'm curious, what, what what were the living conditions that people were in? I mean, of the people that you met there, had they managed to start new lives or were they stuck in really sort of horrible conditions? I know, I think it, Vernon, you'd written about that in the book and I know that was pretty horrible. Yeah, um, so, so he was living in a, in a um, former roadside um, shop, which uh, somebody had kindly lent him to to sleep in but on a camp bed um no water no electricity no loo just still like a cash register and lots of um empty shelves so not at all an appropriate place to be living mm -hmm. but other people had um other people have rebuilt their lives and um there's a really interesting man um who i met there called ken morgan who had um who had been refused re-entry to Britain after a trip to Jamaica, actually, I think in the 1990s. Um, so it's worth saying, I suppose, that there are two, um, there are two parts to this whole problem. Um, that there have been um, refusals of re-entry of people in this situation for, for decades. Um, but the kind of much more recent thing with the turning up of the hostile environment in, in the UK has, has led to lots of people having problems internally. But anyway, um, Ken Morgan had been told in the 1990s that he wasn't able to go back to Britain, even though he'd had primary school, secondary school, much of his working life here. Um, and he was quite kind of phlegmatic. And he said, well, you, you know, um, the sun still rises and sets, even if you're not allowed to return to Britain and he'd rebuilt uh, a life. So, uh, you know, it, it depends a lot on people's um, circumstances. I think it's interesting about what you just said about, um, you know, the whole hostile environment having gone on for decades. Mm -hmm. I think I interviewed somebody relatively recently. I'm, I'm just, I was just sort of doing an oral history 
um, on the Windrush generation in general, mm. you know, just sort of a non-specific mm. one. And then one one of the things she had raised was that she'd been born in Guyana, um, I think in the late 1930s, um, and then had come over to the UK in 1960 or thereabouts, trained as a nurse, um, and she'd left her children behind. Um, she'd qualified as, as, as an SRN nurse, and then gone back to Guyana, hoped to work there, but couldn't. Mm. Um, and then went to pick up her children at the same time. And it was on her return, um, and I think it would have been about 1967, somewhere around there, where she was returning, and they wouldn't let her in. And she, she was confused as to why she couldn't come back into the country. Mm. And um, they ended up stamping um, something in her passport. She had to then they gave her two months uh, permission to stay in the UK for two months and she had to contact um, the home office to find out why she could only have um, two months that she had you know she explained she was an SRN nurse she'd qualified she was coming back she was British and I think one of the things that's I mean I was sort of going through your book and looking at when the initial um, when the initial sort of flags were were, were were raised um strange sort of you know because I, I noticed like with Paulette for example she had applied for mm. her passport in 2005 and mm. had been rejected then mm. um and it was something that I was interested in the course of my research was looking at when when did they actually start um having problems you know before mm. they were being um before the hot you know Theresa May's hostile environment was in place Mm. It seems that a lot of people had already lost their jobs. You know, it's quite common to see people who'd lost their jobs in um, 2006, 2007, mm. Mm. Um, and that they initially have legal aid at that point, and then they lose legal aid mm. and that sort of thing. So, um, and a yeah, few I other mean, it's, people, sorry, I was just going to say, a few other people yeah. had lost, had 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 similar experiences in the 80s and in the 90s. Mm. Um, you know, I just I just wondered if those people as well now can apply for any kind of, you know, because it, some of them are still in the Caribbean. Some of those people who weren't allowed re-entry are still mm. in the Caribbean. Mm, mm. Um, so so um, the people affected by these problems, um, it, it, it does, it goes back decades. And I think um, anybody who finds themselves in that situation now who is still stuck in the um, Caribbean should absolutely be in touch with the Windrush uh, task force to, uh, I mean, there are two separate um, government helplines. I think one is um, the task force that helps you to get your papers. And then there's the compensation body, which is is separate. But absolutely, it's not, it's not um, something that is entirely um, uh, restricted to, to people who are affected post 2010. But it's a really interesting area because um, whenever, whenever um, the Home Secretaries, a series of different Home Secretaries from Amber Rudd to Sajid Javid to Priti Patel and Prime Ministers apologise for this, they're always very, very careful to point out that this was a problem that has its um, origins going back um, different governments and is, is something that um, uh, happened under Labour as well, which is absolutely true. Mm. Um, but it's also slightly disingenuous because um, the kind of the scale of the problem um, increased exponentially with the introduction of the hostile environment policies from kind of 2012 onwards. So even if you um, had perhaps lost your job before 2010, um, you were much more likely to um, lose it after 2010 or after 2012 when fines from for employers um, who were found to be uh, employing somebody without documentation went up very, very swiftly and now stands at around um, £20,000. And so I think pre-2010, there was um, legislation making it clear that you shouldn't employ somebody who was here illegally or you should do checks on, on people's documentation. But it was a much, much more um, light touch uh, bit of policy and it wasn't particularly checked and, and the kind of level of immigration enforcement um, just wasn't there. 
So it's um, it's certainly a problem that has existed for for decades, um, and particularly with that question of, of people getting stuck abroad. Um, but um, but all of the issues around um, people being targeted for um, detention, people being um, very actively um, sought out as as potential illegal immigrants, that has um, is, is is much more the result of um, the hostile environment policies. Yeah, I think it's it seems like it's um, maybe some of the policies are also linked to terrorism. You know, sort of looking at the there's a 2006 piece of legislation, mm. um, which is where I think we f- see the first piece of legislation that asks employers to check people's passport status. Mm. Um, and that's just after the uh, 2005 um, Terrorism Act in London. Oh, right. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah and I think that I sounds think, very plausible. Mm. Just looking at, at the acts that have come in, a lot of them seem to be about initially about um, finding ways around managing terrorism, you know, mm. for people who are British, <laughs> but um, who are British terrorist, terrorists overseas and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but I, but um, I was just sort of curious to know from you if, if you'd ever, you, you were able to interview the government because I know in, the, in, in your book you interview obviously the people who are the survivors did mm. you get much out of the government I mean when you did you interview people at the home office um so it was incredibly frustrating because um as I say when we for every article that you publish um you, you have to get a home office reaction and the reaction, um, the response would be more or less um, the same, which is, you know, these people um, need to fill in application forms. They need to get legal advice. And I spend a lot of time explaining really at the kind of lower level of, of um, the hierarchy that that, that that wasn't possible because legal aid had been abolished and that people couldn't afford the £1,000 or £1,200 needed for um, the naturalisation. But at the same time, I was making requests to um, have um, interviews with with people, um, government ministers, and um, I, I think I don't. I mean, I don't think I was ever given. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, before it all um, kicked off, the the response was was no. Um, Sajid Javid gave me some time um, when he was when he was sent Home Secretary, um, and he, um, uh, you know, gave a, a very thoughtful commentary on it. Um, and I came away feeling that he was, you know, that this was an issue that he minded about and he was embarrassed about, but he was at the same time also. Um, slightly kicking it into the long grass in that he was waiting for um, the results of, of the lessons learned review which we have now had and I felt a bit frustrated I sense uh, I think about the lack of a sense of urgency about how um, you know about how quickly people really needed to be um, compensated and to move on and I also um, spoke to Amber Rudd afterwards once um, once she had uh, resigned and before she got her new job, um, she was before she became um, mm. went to the DWP, and she was um, uh, quite willing at that point to be very open about what she felt had had gone wrong. So you, you, you know, I mean, just think as a journalist, you are very um, it, it's it, it's very frustrating when people don't talk to you and you're grateful when they do because it it kind of helps with the general sense of um of understanding but you, you, there are still so many questions i'd like to ask the home office and lots of things that i think that they could clear up very very quickly um mm. by a bit of transparency and i haven't ever really had a, a session where i've been able to say i don't understand this can you explain this mm. particularly around the um destruction of all of the um of all of the landing slips that happened in 2010 and 
that remains to me something that I think is is significant and um, kind of disturbing, but which I just don't feel I, I really understand. And somebody there knows it all, you know, it's just, it's, it's just frustrating that it's not possible to get those answers. I, I actually, I don't know if you remember, that was one of the things that was really annoying me. <laughs> After I'd read your your book and you 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 know you sort of talked about the destruction of the landing cars, and I just thought, why yeah. would anybody do that? Um, yeah. And I asked, um, I sent an email, you know, one of the freedom of information emails, and I, after a lot of to and fro, I got a response. So yeah. I'll share it. <laughs> great, great. Um, so um, one of the things that they said was that there are two sorts of landing cars. Um, <laughs> It says the destruction of landing cards themselves depended on the type of um, arrival they related to, controlled or non-controlled. So around 95% of landing cards related to non-controlled landings and were only kept for a maximum of 28 days before being destroyed and were not routinely retained. Um, and then they talk about, he talks about uh, con controlled cards that relate mainly to passengers who arrive in the UK for non-visit purposes. So, for example, things like settlement. Mm. And um, I think David Lammy actually brought this up with Caroline Noakes. And she said that the data was only kept for around 15 years. Um, but in any case, I think they're also making... Um, uh, they'd mentioned that they weren't required until the implementation of the 1971 Immigration Act. So before 1971, no one would have had to have had a, um, apparently had to have had a, a landing card, um, except in sort of rare circumstances. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much about, but see, about I think, it. I, mean, I think, because um, one of the other things they were talking about is the problem that we, we talk now about a Windrush generation, but of course, back then, no one was really talking in terms of Windrush. So they weren't yeah. indexed in that kind of a way. Um, so even though um, I think some members, some people within the Home Office, certainly the more junior members of the Home Office often referred to those index cards. And I think this is something you write about in your mm. in your book as well. Um, they're, they're sort of saying, well, they, they would never have been able to use their landing cards as evidence of anything other than to say that was the date they arrived. I mean, it didn't indicate ongoing residency and therefore it was sort of more or less irrelevant. Yeah. So, so I think I've had in passing some of those answers and I mean, I'm sure that's all true, you know, that, 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 as a database, it was a flawed and not um, not at all comprehensive database. And yet it was a database that was used routinely by people who were sitting within the Home Office and trying to help people who were trying to prove um, to, to Home Office staff that they were here legally and who were tearing their hair out because they were finding it so difficult. So I don't, I'm not at all suggesting that this was the most kind of beautiful and and um, excellent of archives, but it was a really useful bit of history that was helpful to some people. But again, I suppose that really goes to my point, which is that if anybody, for example, who had been in charge of Home Office archives had been able to sit down with me and say, this is how many people, how many bits of paper were destroyed this is what they said I mean a lot of this kind of mystery would would be um would have been removed and I suppose some some sometimes on social media I see a lot of anger from people who say you know and the Windrush happened and they destroyed the archives and it's it's sort of true it is true but it's it's become this most kind of centrally significant thing that happened when I think it's an interesting and unfortunate thing that happened rather than the most scandalous mm. element in this whole you know depressing story.
that is interesting because I, I, one of the things I found sort of curious about the whole landing cards case was that um, Caroline Noakes, without being solicited, just happened to mention that in any case, there was no obligation to keep them um, because they didn't, I think somebody raised a question about the fact that obviously the hostile environment in a sense was, well, inevitably dis discriminatory and therefore went against the Equalities Act. Mm. And, um, but then she had replied that there was no obligation to complete an equality impact assessment. Um, you know, the need to sort of comply with the Public Sector Duty Act wasn't applicable to issues of immigration. Um, and so therefore, mm. you could sort of be discriminatory if it fell under the umbrella of, of immigration. Mm. which you know I found well, slightly I mean, disturbing uh, yeah, <laughs> to say no, the no, least. I mean this but... is um this is something <laughs> that comes up in um in Wendy Williams's um really excellent review into what went wrong with um Windrush and and one of the points is is the home office's um willingness to to lean on this exemption um that it has from um equalities legislation and she um, says that, that they kind of lean on it to an excessive degree and that that needs to be to be rethought. Mm. But yeah, all, all of those answers about um, why the Home Office destroyed the documents, uh, uh, they, they're, they're, there are so many different reasons put forward, you know, that they weren't necessary, that it was for data protection, that, I, I mean, there are too many excuses. And, and I think that always <laughs> raises um, questions. Yeah, I think especially when you combine it with the question of, of what um, effort did the government actually make to let people know they had to register or had to naturalise. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I know there was sort of there was that, um, some talk about it in the 1980s. Mm. But that I don't think there was ever any explanation as to what the implications might have been if you didn't naturalise well, or register. Not, not least because the implications for not registering in 1982, I think it was, mm. are completely different from what the implications are post the introduction of the hostile environment. So, in 1982, you you know you there was there was some. Um, publicity and there was some kind of attempt to get um, different areas around the country where there was high um, immigration from Commonwealth countries to, to engage with this but you know it was a it was a kind of a choice and um, there was no sense that there would be really devastating consequences from from neglecting to do that and that's why, again, um, in, in this um, Wendy Williams lesson learnt review, one of the interesting findings is that there was a real ignorance amongst um, officials and ministers of our history, of our, um, of our Immigration and Nationality Act um, history, because these new policies were, were put in place in, in the face of some warnings from a number of kind of quite quite prescient um, uh, think tanks and and um, research groups but they were they were put in place without real um, thoughtfulness about about how that could um, interplay with changes to um, immigration leg legislation mm -hmm. and, yeah yeah I think I think um, what I found interesting is that there's two sort of issues in terms of um, the government because it seems that different laws apply to different islands um, and whether or not you remained British depended a lot on whether your country you know the date at which your country became independent mm. um, so I guess that's probably why Jamaica in a sense is, is the country that's been um, or Jamaicans are the people that be most heavily impacted by this because they became independent in 62. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got other other sort of islands that became much later in the, in the eighties. I think it's like Saint Kitts or somewhere is probably nineteen eighty three. So mm-hmm. the impact on the different islands is really very different. And mm-hmm. I haven't been able to find any evidence anywhere of the government ever saying, you know, the moment your country becomes independent is the exact same moment that you lose your British citizenship. I mean, it's automatic. And I hadn't mm. really realized that that was, was something that had um, been in place. But the other thing is I was trying to sort of find out what, how they'd um, publicized the need to register um, documents. And I found a, a Hansard document that's a conversation um, between, I don't know, Mr. Does, Mr. Was- Waddington, Mr. Griffiths. Um, anyway, Mr. Hurd, it's got here, it says um, the government, he was basically asked, you know, what what publicity has there been? And this Mm. is a document that's dated to 1986. um, And it says something like the government has taken opportunities to inform community organisations and others about the provisions for those who have a right to register as British citizens, for which applications have to be made by 31st December 1987. Mm. But then the really weird, the, and, and, and basically they, um, he, he says he publi- they're publishing a free information leaflet um, that was then going to be put, um, what does it say, uh, we were publishing a leaflet entitled Your Right to British Citizenship, which describes as clearly as possible those who have the right to British citizenship under these provisions. Um, um, and I think the leaflets were being left at the passport office. But it, they also say the leaflet makes clear there is no obligation to apply and that people may still apply for naturalization at any time. Mm. So it's so strange. You know, the whole thing is like, why, why would anybody who derived in Britain as someone who was a British subject ever, why would it ever occur to them to think, OK, so now I have to remember to reapply as British I mean it's always an in, well it is an yeah, insult and, and and there was a cost attached I mean it wasn't a huge cost at that yes. time but it was yeah. there was a cost um and all of this feels very um interesting when you put it alongside the um ongoing process of registering um EU nationals who need to have applied for and received um settled status after Brexit um happens next next year and so the degree to which um public awareness campaigns are successful and um really reach some of the kind of very hard to get to um different splinter communities of eu nationals is is all incredibly um relevant to this to this discussion because as as we've seen here you you know you can have a public awareness campaign um but lots of people won't pay attention and perhaps won't feel that they need to do it. And even though, you know, there has been a pretty high take up so far of um, EU citizens applying for status, because the overall population is something like 3.8 million people, um, you, you you don't have to miss out a very high percentage for that to run into tens of thousands of people who could just as the um, Windrush generation have done, could find themselves um, embraced by the hostile environment in, you know, at some point in the future. No, I think you're right. And it's interesting because I've been joining since I've been locked indoors with the uh, problems due to COVID-19. I've Mm. been joining a lot of the Windrush um, Zoom calls that they've been having you know a lot of the different organizations have been setting up zoom calls Mm. and what's been interesting in that is a lot of people from other countries have been joining in to find Mm. out how they regularize their status and a lot of other Europeans as well you know (laughs) from you know whether Polish or elsewhere so Mm. I I found that really interesting. Have Um, you been uh, have they been um, home office organized uh, sessions or sessions organized by community groups? No, sessions organised by the community groups. I, mm. I don't know to what extent the Home Office, you know, beyond what Wendy Williams spoke that about. That the Home Office has announced that they're doing some online outreach um, sessions to, for people um, who are still struggling with applications, I think. 
I haven't I haven't um, listened in but I should do <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah no I mean it just sounds really the whole thing sounds really nuts I mean in terms of uh, assistance with the um, you know even with the compensation forms it sounds on the one hand, it's sort of straightforward, and, and on another hand, it's it's how do you quantify things like the trauma that you've experienced? Mm. You know, a lot of the people that I've spoken to are visibly traumatized by what they've they've been through and don't have the energy. You know, I mean they've got they may have their status regularized now, but the last thing they then have the energy to do is to be thinking, you know, how do I fill in this compensation form? What do I do? Mm. A lot of a lot of people are just trying to get back to good health you know um mm. but i i wanted to to go back to pick back on something you'd mentioned earlier about um you know looking back at your book you know the mm. gaps that might exist in in, in what you've already written mm. do you have any recommendations that you give to academics or other writers who are interested in this field um what what are the sort of questions you think um we should be thinking about and also what um you know what? What do we what do we need to be looking for? Hmm. Um, so the question that I just, I don't know if it's an academic question. It's certainly a journalistic question. The the area that I'm really curious about um, and haven't managed to make progress with is um, is the 160 people who are the at the most extreme end of of um, being affected by all of this. So we know um, because there was a very um, labor intensive internal home office uh, review, which I think, I think they called it the historical review, where they went through um, 11,000 cases of people who had been um, detained or removed from this country in a relevant period back to the Caribbean. And they found that 160 people had been wrongly detained or removed and I think 80 of them were removed um, and they don't call it deportation because deportation is only if you committed a criminal offence and and for whatever reason they decided not to investigate people who were removed and who'd committed a criminal offence so the actual number of people who were mistakenly removed to the Caribbean will be much higher but this group of 80 people is the people who hadn't committed any criminal offence at all. Um, and that, that actually that number would be much higher as well if you were to include in that the people who were wrongly removed to other com Commonwealth countries. So they say for, for reasons of cost, they've only done that historical review for um, Caribbean countries. And this goes back to this this whole kind of stupidity around um the term of of this this being the windrush scandal because it, it's kind of a very helpful um term in some ways in that it, it helps people to to get a, a sense of what kind of generation of people you're talking about and give an idea of in in a nutshell of what what the um you know what migration um cohort you're talking about but actually it, it's also extremely unhelpful because I met somebody only the other week who who said he didn't think he was eligible for help under the Windrush scheme because he didn't arrive on the Windrush ship, and and you know of course nobody nobody affected by this actually came on the Empire Windrush. It's it's people um, who came in the 1950s and, and 1960s. Um, and also he didn't think he was um, eligible because he came from Nigeria. And, and of course, you, you know, there is a whole other um, group of, of Commonwealth born um, long term residents who are absolutely um, included under the scheme, but, but who don't really know that they are because of this um, un, unhelpful term. Anyway, in, in, in the um, research that government that the Home Office did, they found that 80 people have been um, wrongly removed. And I no um maybe I've, I've heard of about maybe four or five and i just think that's um such a kind of 
extreme and extraordinary thing. And the Home Office knows all of all of the details of, of who those people were and what's happened to them. And something like 14 of them died before um, before officials were able to get in touch with them. Yeah. So I would really like to know m- more about that. Um, but it's not something I've managed to um, make any progress with. Um, what else would I... Um, I'd like to I'd like to have the minutes from the ministerial um, hostile environment working group um, meetings that were set up by David Cameron from kind of 2012 mm-hmm. onwards, and that was when he was so determined to come up with policies that would um, help to push down net migration and help to um, help to do immigration enforcement work beyond the home office because if you remember it was a time of um you know 20 percent cuts to home office budget and and there was an understanding that it was going to be so expensive to um target and and do immigration enforcement on everybody who they felt was here illegally that they decided to outsource it to um other departments so um, Ministry of Health, Department for Education, Housing, and also to individuals like landlords, and and to make um, to make kind of immigration enforcement officers out of a whole range of different people. Um, and yeah, I'd I'd love to know how how the detail of the discussions within that meeting, because um, we know from kind of. Uh, the occasional leak that um, people like Eric Pickles was very worried about the um, potential for um, racially discriminatory outcomes to come from these policies. And and we know from um, David Laws's autobiography that that, um, David Cameron was at at one point so enraged by his colleagues' um, lack of enthusiasm for, for these policies that he stormed out of the, the meeting but I just think um, there will be the, the kind of granular detail of those discussions would be very mm. um, informative um, and mm. interesting. No absolutely and I think one of the things I'm just listening to you talk I'm just thinking how useless um, Pretty Patel's apology is because you know when you, when you mentioned about um, you know, the Nigerian who hadn't realised that, mm. you know, he was eligible to regularise his status under the Windrush mm. scandal. And I don't feel at all that the government have made any efforts to disabuse people of misunderstandings in terms of the label Windrush. Mm. Um, and But also because, you know, there are a lot of other people. I, I, I was looking at one of the reports from Sajif Javid that had a list of lots of other nationalities, whether you're Bangladeshi, mm. Indian or whatever, all sorts of different people who had been affected um, by the hostile environment, but who were here legitimately. Mm. Um, and certainly I know a lot of Nigerians and Ghanaians who are in Nigeria now and in Ghana now who can't get back. So it's, it's interesting... Um, you know, it doesn't feel that there's anything genuine about it because they're not doing anything to assist those particular people either. Or, mm. you know, so... Well, I think, I think the other thing is that we've had um, two, two and a bit years of, of apologies about what went wrong, mm. but, um, but, no, but no concession that perhaps the legislation that um, un- underpins all of this M- might be in need of a review so but you know it's been changed um the title's been changed from hostile to compliant but the mm. legislation remains and it's been interesting actually during lockdown to see other um parts of of this policy come under greater public scrutiny than than we've seen before so um the nhs uh, surcharge which is another I lost oh, you. can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm going to go on talking and you can tell me if you if my voice comes back. Ah, there we go. I've got you back now. <laughs> has it has it come back? Yes, yes, yes. You cut off for a while, but um, it's saying my oh, okay. internet connection's unstable. Oh, it's right. a bit worrying. Okay. But. Um, 
yeah, no, I was just saying that it's um, interesting to see people's response to the NHS uh, surcharge, and uh, which was another policy that comes from this um, from this um, era, and and a, a kind of a, a sense, a, a public sense that this is a perhaps not tremendously fair bit of legislation, and so you know finally that's been um reviewed and although Priti Patel said there wasn't going to be a review within kind of three days there was a decision that um it, a lot more people are going to be exempted from it so it's it's just quite interesting to see um what you know what external events make people aware of how we're treating um uh, new arrivals to this country and what aspects of those policies are considered to be fair and, and what aren't but the kind of huge um fundamental rethinking about whether or not we are in favor of um the hostile environment legislation that hasn't really happened uh philip did you want to have the uh last word no no uh, really just to to thank you both so much and and um it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, we, we've, we've had, you know, about 40 people in, in the room um, asking really interesting questions. And um, so this is, this is an area in which, you know, the Institute continues, will continue to, to work with and sort of exploring these histories and preserving these histories. So if, if anyone uh, who joined this meeting as things that they think that we can work with them on, please, please let us know. It's it's a really important area of research for us. But but thank you, Amelia and Juanita, for really fascinating two hours. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Bye. Bye.